Okay, welcome to our next lecture on uh, the background of the Salem Witch Trials. And uh, today I want to concentrate on the uh, early historiography of the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, obviously, this is, uh, as Mary Beth Norton uh, says at the beginning of her book uh, that the Salem Wish Trials are the 800-pound uh, gorilla of early American history. To some extent, it doesn't deserve to be. Uh, it is comparatively a small event. It is certainly a regional uh, event, nothing that has any great implications uh, for the, the entirety of early American history by any means. There are many events and, and, and phenomena that are of much greater importance and significance. But, um, you know, the Salem Wish Trials has uh, a degree of magnetism to it that, uh, uh, as an early Americanist, you have to address it. Uh, you have to devote sometimes an entire day uh, in a U.S. history survey course lecturing on the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, it's a, it comes at a good point in that uh, in a semester, you know, sometimes students start to drift away from their interest, uh, and uh, Salem Witch Trials helps to pull people back a little bit. So, okay, fine. Uh, it, is a, it is a fascinating event in itself, and it does have implications for regional history, for New England history, to be sure. Um, but... Uh, uh, Let's uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of of uh, more specific day to day chronicles of what happened and analysis of, of of the event, let's talk a little bit about historiography. So, the first historian to tackle the subject was Charles Upham, uh, a, a native Bostonian, who. Uh, wrote a rather exhaustive two-volume study called Salem Witchcraft in 1867. And uh, uh, he was a, a reasonably good historian. He did what every good historian should do. Um, he scoured Essex County and elsewhere looking for as many records as could be found uh, pertaining to the witch trials. Uh, as a matter of fact... The actual records of most of the, the, the trial transcripts themselves were lost in a fire uh, some years before, and, and others lost over time. Uh, some of that stuff's been gathered back up and, and, and relocated or, or discovered in the form of copies, um, and Upham gathered what he could. Uh, including a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, notion. Uh, instead of just saying, I'm going to find all the documents and just tell the story of what happened, he wanted to know where everything happened exactly. Because by 1867, uh, what was Salem Village was no longer part of Salem. It was its own town that is still called Danvers, um, and so what he did was he, he found maps of the disposition of the uh, most of the major households uh, in Salem Village and Salem Town uh, and uh, mapped them relative to uh, the, the, the locations of things at the time in, in the 1860s uh, to come up with a very, very nice map showing where m most of the principal actors uh, were located, uh, especially those who were, you know, direct participants in the trials, accused witches, uh, prominent members of, of the uh, of the town and the village who were witnesses and, and testified in the trials, um, and through the the you know through his research and his analysis of the uh, of of the uh, documents and uh, interpreting the event. He came to the conclusion uh, that, um, frankly, all of this was simply the result of a superstitious belief in witchcraft and the occult. Uh, it is a sign of the relative backwardness of colonial society relative to his own more modern America of the mid-19th century. Uh, and uh, 
basically said that this was uh, marked an interesting turning point in that uh, after 1692, you have the beginnings of the American Enlightenment. Uh, and it's not very much longer after this, for instance, that uh, Benjamin Franklin is born, who's going to become the greatest exponent of this American Enlightenment, but then there are others as well. So looking back, from a very presentist standpoint, he looked at the, the, uh, the events of 1691, 92, 93, and said that this was the last gasp of medievalism. Uh, before the dawning of the Enlightenment in 18th century America. Um, and the great value of the book uh, definitely uh, has to do with this, this lovely map. Uh, you're going to see a lot of this in similar maps uh, in, in the course of uh, studying the witch trials. So it's a good time to take a look at the local geography. So, as you know, Salem was founded uh, on a nice natural harbor just northeast of Boston. Uh, in fact, for much of its, hi of its history in the, in the 17th and early 18th centuries, it was easily the second busiest port in Massachusetts. Um, down here, if you can you know, see the label there, Town of Salem. So here is the town proper. Okay, um, up here is the incorporated town of Beverly. Over here to the north is Topsfield. Over here is Andover and Reading and Lynn, uh, Massachusetts. All of these individual towns, so, you know, kind of nearby uh, Salem. Uh, but what you have up here that is outlined by Upham are the, bit, the borders of unincorporated land uh, that uh, basically uh, Salem, laid, Salem Town laid claim to. And it was entirely uh, agricultural land that was occupied by people who were uh, related to and otherwise connected to people living in Salem Town. And so it was originally called the Farms, um, later Salem Farms, and then f it started uh, uh, a campaign to separate itself from Salem and, and became known as Salem Village or simply as the Village. And as you can see, uh, Upham went to a lot of trouble to map out the extant roads uh, in 1692, uh, and as you can see, the main roads leading uh, into you know the main road leading into uh, Salem Village was known as the Ipswich Road. Uh, you have a few others that lead, you know head down toward uh, Boston and other parts. Um, he mapped out exactly where the meeting house was, where the parish Paris Parsonage was located, and where various other people were living at the uh, at the time, and so this became an extremely valuable resource for historians to understand the geography of the witch trials. And uh, based on uh, this exhaustive research, two volumes, it's 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 imposing, and his conclusion was one that was not in the least bit surprising for him to reach, or anybody else for that matter at that time, to reach. Uh, historiography in, in the United States and in Europe at the time of the 19th century was extremely presentist. Uh, the past was measured against the present and almost always found wanting. People in the past who did uh, 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 you know baffling things or strange things or stupid things or whatever are uh, deprecated for simply just not being as smart as everybody living in the present day are. Um, why did ordinary people believe in witches and ghosts and all that stuff? Well, because they were superstitious uh, back then, and, they, and that was part of the uh, silliness of that time. Thank goodness we're not that way anymore. That's, that's basically what we're talking about here. So it's not a shocking conclusion for him to have reached. Uh, and it was, for over 80 years, the interpretation of the Salem Witch Trials. 
He wrote the book, he published it, and for all intents and purposes, nobody wrote anything more uh, about the Salem Witch Trials in that intervening time. Every so often, somebody may write something about it in the form of an article or some little piece in a newspaper or a magazine, and all they do is just echo what Upham said, what Upham wrote. Uh, that, uh, well, here's what happened, but then what are you, you going to do? People back then were superstitious and silly and hyper-religious, and that's what they tend to believe. And so, of course, you're going to have witches and uh, bad procedure in the court and, and the travesty that, that ensued. So, as I said, pretty much nobody wrote anything about the Salem Witch Trials again until 1949 when Marion L. Starkey came out with The Devil in Massachusetts. And what's interesting is that in the 1940s, that this was a period um, when uh, the, 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 the psychology of Sigmund Freud was immensely popular uh, in um, psychiatric circles in the United States. Uh, I mean, we're going back to the, the, the 20s and 30s uh, when Freudian uh, concepts gradually took over the psychiatric community for all intents and purposes. And then, they, and then it starts to leak into the popular culture. Um, and so by the 1940s, uh, most people, to one extent or another, were pretty familiar with the the, the, the most superficial kind of basic uh, ideas that uh, uh, Sigmund Freud uh, propagated as far as uh, uh, psychoanalysis. So if you went to see a psychiatrist for a problem at this time, they employed uh, the type of, of uh, analysis that is still somewhat caricatured in a sense that, you, you know, the, the, the doctor would sit in a, in a nice armchair while the patient lied on, lay on a couch and talked about their mother and their father and their upbringing, their childhood and all of that, and looking for the root causes of neuroses and, and um, uh, um, you know, tics and odd behaviors and downright uh, serious uh, mental illness as stemming from uh, traumas or unresolved issues relating to childhood, and specifically with regard to the relationship to the parents. And what Freud had said, uh, among other things, was that uh, in, in most cases, uh, he tended, he, you know, he, he agreed with the entire psychiatric community at this time, for instance, in believing that uh, uh, homosexuality was uh, a kind of aberration, not uncommon, but still an aberration from the norm of heterosexuality. So when he talked about, uh, quote unquote, normal psychological development, he talked about it in terms of little boys uh, will model and emulate their fathers and learn about manhood from their fathers while developing relationships with their mothers that are essentially a kind of practice for what they will do when they uh, grow to sexual and emotional maturity and begin to seek uh, partners of the opposite sex. And this is what led to this notion that he he said that the, that um, uh that little boys grow up with a subconscious desire to um, have their mothers in exactly the same way as their fathers did, and that results in a kind of competition between sons and their fathers uh, for their for for uh, their you know for mothers' affection. Uh, which was somewhat blown up into, oh, little boys want to uh, have sex with their mothers. Well, that's not exactly what Freud was saying, although he did not deny that that uh, existed. Uh, and uh, conversely, the same thing for little girls. Little girls learn about womanhood and model from their mothers and, I, and, and, and uh, learn about manhood from their, from their fathers in the sense that, that you know, that uh, then they also are going to develop a sort of a competitive adversarial relationship with their mothers in competition for father's 
uh, attention. Um, the the notion that little boys are, are are competing with their fathers and ultimately want to supplant their fathers in their mother's affection, as he called the Oedipus complex, which he took from the mythical mythological story of Oedipus, who unknowingly uh, kills his father, marries his mother, and 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 then finds out about this later, and uh, then blinds himself. Uh, for committing this uh, unpardonable sin of incest. And he said for, for little girls, the corresponding idea is the Electra complex, again, taken from Greek mythology. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, these concepts were hugely popular uh, in the United States, and, and Marion Starkey decided that Charles Upham's rather antiquated by this point uh, interpretation of the Salem Wish Trials um, needed to go, and it needed a more modern interpretation. It's not that she disagreed, necessarily, with the fact that they were superstitious and backward. Uh, that that was still largely a, a conviction that, that she would have agreed with, but what actually caused the afflicted girls to accuse people, and why did the trials unfold the way they did? Well, she applied a Freudian psychological interpretation to come up with an idea that the afflicted girls. Now, as you're going, as you're going to read, yes, the 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 majority of the people who were afflicted were female, and many of them were young. But there were some men among the afflicted, and 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 uh, we mustn't uh, uh, lose sight of that. But she focused on the adolescent uh, girls who were claiming affliction and said that ultimately what was going on here is you have young young girls becoming women who are, without their realizing it, attacking patriarchy, uh, attacking male authority in Salem, uh, going after fa male family members, going after prominent men in the community, and that it is a kind of a mass psychosis, a kind of mass electra complex that these girls are uh, uh, afflicted by. And then when you look at other aspects of the trials and the information that, that you know, in the testimony, uh, some of which is either blatantly or at least implicitly sexual. Starkey was very interested in that as well, as was as had been Freud, right? So she became very interested in the sexual aspects of witchcraft and the preponderance of the accused older females as proof of a society suffering from a mass Oedipus complex. So, okay, so... Um, it's not just the afflicted girls having an electric complex. She then broadens it out and says, well, because of the sexual nature of, of some of what was going on here, we also have uh, um, a kind of Oedipus complex going on as well because the young girls attacking the older women is something that would have been seen in Freudian terms as trying to curry favor with elder male authority. Okay, uh, so as I said, this comes across ultimately as a very interesting interpretation of the Salem Witch Trials. Um, certainly, it, it is uh, uh, a it is innovative in the attempt to try to psychoanalyze the leading figures, uh, the major figures in the Salem Witch Trials. Um, uh, it, it, it's an interpretation that no that does not hold up very well. Uh, it's the, the, there's some little kernels of probable truth in 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 there, uh, but it's more of a product of its time. In the same way that uh, uh, Charles Upham's book was a, a product of its time. Nevertheless, for twenty years, uh, this is essentially the, 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 you know, the final word on the Salem Witch Trials. So um, it's still, a lo you know, to a large extent, it's still about the backwardness and superstitiousness of 17th century Puritan society. But now we're getting into, well, it's that plus um, 
you know, the, the, it was a kind of a mass psychosis, right? And, uh, you know, these, these neurotic people living on the fringes of, of, uh, of um, English civilization in, in North America. Um, and uh, something that, to some extent, is probably evident in a lot of societies, in a lot of communities uh, as well. And it was this interpretation specifically that influenced Arthur Miller uh, in writing his play, uh, The Crucible, which is specifically about uh, the witch trials, or at least it uses the Salem witch trials to tell a story about 1953, uh, which was the time of the uh, Red Scare following World War II um, and the growth and the power of the Soviet Union and then of China, Soviet, or Russian, I'm sorry, uh, of, um, you know, communist China and, and, and uh, the fear that Americans increasingly felt that um, communist ideology was starting to take over the world and was it infiltrating American society in one way or another? And this, in its own way, spawned a kind of mass psychosis that Miller, reading Marion Starkey and thinking about, you know, said, hey, what's happening right now with the degree to which people are looking for and hunting out communists and, 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 and the way that we're treating people that we suspect of being communist is exactly the same as what was done in Salem when uh, they were, you know, trying to find witches and, you know, everywhere and, and trying to figure out where the satanic influence was coming, coming through. So uh, what I want to do uh, is talk a little bit about the fact that the uh, you know, this, this uh, House and American Activities Committee, it comes around in 1945. There were previous committees, but these were ad hoc committees or temporary committees trying to find uh, specific suspected uh, communists or communist organizations here and there. Um, the, 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 the arenas in which they searched for communists were mainly among artists, intellectuals, and academics. Um, not long after the House Committee is established, the, a matching Senate committee chaired by Senator Joseph McCarthy is established. And that's the one that has the most uh, uh, you know, negative reputation. Joseph McCarthy's um, uh, you know, almost fanatical uh, paranoia about communists is something that that uh, was uh, uh, you know indicative of the kind of fervor that one uh, by this point, if they were familiar with the Salem Wish Trials, said, "Oh, this is exactly like what you see from some of the magistrates in in Salem." Um, what is interesting in this respect, and it's something that mirrors what happens in the Salem Wish Trials as well. Uh, is that people who are brought before the committee on some suspicion of communist uh, party membership or communist sympathies or, or perhaps they are associated with other people who might have been members of the party or in America or uh, uh, harboring uh, sympathies um, would be given a pass for all intents and purposes if they were willing to admit uh that they were communists or were sympathetic to communists as long as they named co-conspirators, as it were, or named other associates. Uh, and as you know from the Salem Witch Trials, uh, what happens is that a lot of people who are accused of, of witchcraft find that what should have been an automatic uh, sentence of death uh, is commuted as long as the uh, the the uh, uh, confessed witch named other people as as witches. Uh, similar thing happened with the House Un American Activities Committee and the Senate Committee as well. Uh, they're focused on looking for communist infiltrators in the federal government and the entertainment industry. They're not looking necessarily at ordinary citizens, uh, 
they do look at things like uh, labor unions and, and, and the what, but and, and things like that. But mostly they're really interested in the entertainment industry and, and obviously intellectual circles. And this is where Arthur Miller comes in, right? You know, and, and uh, sus- you know, a lot of suspected communists in, uh, um, you know, in the artist communities, especially writers and, and uh um, novelists, screenplay writers, theater writers like Miller himself end up on a blacklist where they are uh, they are essentially barred from being able to get their work published or have their work seen, uh, regardless of whether they you know would have admitted to anything or not. It doesn't matter. Just being uh, suspected was enough to presume guilt. Uh, especially once the once your name hits the uh, the the radio airwaves or gets printed in a newspaper, uh, and this was something that Miller was especially concerned about was the destruction of reputation. Uh, to what extent might you be willing to besmirch your own name in, in by giving out other names? Um, you know, for the sake of, of, of getting sort of off a, off the hook or whatever. But what Miller saw was a lot of friends and associates uh, being caught up in these dragnets. And so he wrote The Crucible as an allegory for what was happening at the time. So let's watch a film that talks a little bit about uh, this phenomenon. Imagine that one day you're summoned before a government panel. Even though you haven't committed any crime or been formally charged with one, you are repeatedly questioned about your political views, accused of disloyalty, and asked to incriminate your friends and associates. If you don't cooperate, you risk jail or losing your job. This is exactly what happened in the United States in the 1950s as part of a campaign to expose suspected communists. Named after its most notorious practitioner, the phenomenon known as McCarthyism destroyed thousands of lives and careers. For over a decade, American political leaders trampled democratic freedoms in the name of protecting them. During the 1930s and 1940s, there had been an active but small communist party in the United States. Its record was mixed. While it played crucial roles in wider progressive struggles for labor and civil rights, it also supported the Soviet Union. From the start, the American Communist Party faced attacks from conservatives and business leaders, as well as from liberals who criticized its ties to the oppressive Soviet regime. During World War II, when the USA and USSR were allied against Hitler, some American communists actually spied for the Russians. When the Cold War escalated and this espionage became known, domestic communism came to be seen as a threat to national security. But the attempt to eliminate that threat soon turned into the longest lasting and most widespread episode of political repression in American history. Spurred on by a network of bureaucrats, politicians, journalists, and businessmen, the campaign wildly exaggerated the danger of communist subversion. The people behind it harassed anyone suspected of holding left-of-center political views or associating with those who did. If you hung modern art on your walls, had a multiracial social circle, or signed petitions against nuclear weapons, you might just have been a communist. Starting in the late 1940s, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover used the resources of his agency to hunt down such supposed communists and eliminate them from any position of influence within American society. And the narrow criteria that Hoover and his allies used to screen federal employees spread to the rest of the country. Soon, Hollywood studios, universities, car manufacturers, and thousands of other public and private employers were imposing the same political tests on the men and women who worked for them. Meanwhile, Congress conducted its own witch hunt, subpoenaing hundreds of people to testify before investigative bodies like the House Un-American Activities Committee. If they refused to cooperate, they could be jailed for contempt, or, more commonly, 
fired and blacklisted. Ambitious politicians like Richard Nixon and Joseph McCarthy used such hearings as a partisan weapon, accusing Democrats of being soft on communism and deliberately losing China to the communist bloc. McCarthy, a Republican senator from Wisconsin, became notorious by flaunting ever-changing lists of alleged communists within the State Department. Egged on by other politicians, he continued to make outrageous accusations while distorting or fabricating evidence. Many citizens reviled McCarthy, while others praised him. And when the Korean War broke out, McCarthy seemed vindicated. Once he became chair of the Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations in 1953, McCarthy's recklessness increased. It was his investigation of the army that finally turned public opinion against him and diminished his power. McCarthy's colleagues in the Senate censured him, and he died less than three years later, probably from alcoholism. McCarthyism ended as well. It had ruined hundreds, if not thousands of lives, and drastically narrowed the American political spectrum. Its damage to democratic institutions would be long-lasting. In all likelihood, there were both Democrats and Republicans who knew that the anti-communist purges were deeply unjust, but feared that directly opposing them would hurt their careers. Even the Supreme Court failed to stop the witch hunt, condoning serious violations of constitutional rights in the name of national security. Was domestic communism an actual threat to the American government? Perhaps, though a small one. But the reaction to it was so extreme that it caused far more damage than the threat itself. And if new demagogues appeared in uncertain times to attack unpopular minorities in the name of patriotism, could it all happen again? Okay, so you see what we're talking about here as far as uh, the, the pervasive fear and paranoia, especially from Miller's point of view, the fear and paranoia on the part of members of the government, both Democrat and Republican, but at the time mostly Republican, uh, in terms of looking for a, uh, and magnifying a communist threat that was not nearly as great as, uh, you know, feared. And it was this fear that led to a polarization of, of the uh, society. So uh, Miller was quoted as saying, with regard to the crucible, ours is a divided empire in which certain ideas and emotions and actions are of God and their opposites are of Lucifer. A political party is equated with a moral right and opposition to it with diabolical malevolence. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is that Miller saw this in the Salem witch trials and wrote about it in the crucible. Um, he saw it in what was happening in, in the 1950s. Um, but uh, if you look through a lot of American history, you do tend to see this, and you, and you also see it in virtually all of human history. We tend to, uh, you know, hold certain opinions and believe that that's equated with what is right and good and just, and then we always tend to deprecate anyone who feels differently than we do or feels, especially if they're opposite or have an idea that is uh, uh, challenging, we tend to equate that with with evil. Uh, and that's just not a, a good way to go about things, but there you go. So the Crucible was a, a, an enormous hit on Broadway uh, and uh, is, uh, has, has practically become a scourge of high school students nationwide. Uh, but uh, it is a play that has been almost continually produced somewhere in the world virtually every year since 1953. And, of course, there have been film adaptations of it, the most uh, famous of which is arguably uh, the uh, 1990s uh, film of The Crucible, which uh, Miller wrote the screenplay for. Uh, at that time, uh, 
where he was, you know, the everyone was less concerned about, uh, you know, government actions uh, against a certain group of people. Uh, so that film seems to focus a little more on just the mechanics of what happened in Salem. Um, but the scenes that Miller wrote and the way that they have been depicted by actors on the stage and on the screen has given us our sense of what happened in Salem. The Crucible is not a history of the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, a lot of characters are missing, a lot of actors are missing, really, literally. Certain characters are compressed uh, into one. You've got, uh, you know, it's an extreme simplification of what happened. Part of that, obviously, to keep things fairly uh, uh, simple, uh, also because you can't have a cast of hundreds of people, <laughs> you know, each playing their specific part. There's no way to do that. Um, but uh, what Miller does is show a society that is extremely neurotic, one that is nearly psychotic in its fear of, of uh, subversive elements or elements that question authority uh, and those authorities who would compel good men and women to accuse their neighbors uh, to save themselves. Uh, and, um, you know, so you, you have scenes in which you have the absolute hysteria of, of, uh, of what was going on in the trials. And to be fair, some seriously weird shenanigans do take place during the Salem West trials. But as I mentioned, most of the actual trial records are missing. Um, and so we're not you know, we can't be 100% sure exactly what transpired on every single day of the trials themselves, except through ancillary documents um, and other kinds of reportage about what happened. But yes, there were there were some moments of downright hysteria and, and uh, panic, uh, to be sure. So it's not unfair for Miller to uh, bring that up. But for a very long time, that is, again, the picture of the Salem Witch Trials that we would have. And it is one of, of superstitious New England Puritans who are so terrified of anything that is unusual or strange uh, that they have no explanation for, that they immediately uh, look to Satan as the cause of, of so, many thing, so many bad things that happen, uh, and immediately ta attack each other. Rather than coming together to deal with the threat, they, they immediately turn on each other. Uh, and again, seen as initially as, oh, that's a relic of the past, but then what Miller does bring up is, no, this is a fairly common human response, uh, a common fear response. So now let's talk about arguably the most famous book published about the Salem Witch Trials, bar none, and it is Paul Boyer and Stephen Nissenbaum's Salem Possessed, The Social Origins of Witchcraft, uh, published in 1972. Um, and uh, just a brief sketch about this book. Uh, at the time, uh, it came out of the experience that Boyer and Nissenbaum had as new assistant professors at the University of Massachusetts uh, in 1969 and 1970. They, uh, neither one of them was an early Americanist. Um, Boyer has uh, unfortunately passed away several years ago. Stephen's still around, uh, but uh, obviously long retired, um, no longer active. Neither one were early Americanists, but what they did was they wanted to team teach a course, a freshman level course that covers just sort of basic historical research uh, as a recruiting tool to kind of encourage students to major uh, in history. And so they came up with this uh, class uh, that was originally designed um, to be a, a two-part kind of course over the, over the course of the semester, right? So the first half of the semester would be a focus on the Salem Witch Trials, and the second half of the semester would be Shays Rebellion. So they would spend up till spring break researching and writing about the Salem Witch Trials, 
take spring break, and then they would uh, then uh, take Shays' Rebellion. Now, the reason they did this, this is University of Massachusetts. So these are two big events in Massachusetts history. So it wasn't just to interest students in majoring in history. It was also to kind of get uh, Native uh, New England students interested in New England history. So they decided to, to, to sort of focus on these two big events uh, uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts history. So in teaching this course for the first time in 1970, they learned very quickly that the Salem Witch Trials was just way too beefy. There was just too much there, the students became extremely interested and energized by doing it, and so uh, within you know within several weeks, uh, uh, Boyer and Nissenbaum decided, well, never mind, we won't worry about Shay's Rebellion. Uh, let's just focus on on the Salem Witch Trials because there's so much here. And what they what they used, uh, they went to the um, what's now called the Peabody Essex Museum. It had a slightly different name back then. Uh, this is a, a museum that's located in uh, Salem, uh, the, in Salem today, modern day Salem, uh, as well as you know the the Essex County court records. Uh, and what they found there uh, were uh, reams of transcriptions of extant uh, trial documents that were. Um, gathered together and transcribed by a team of writers working under a New Deal program in the 1930s that was called the Writers Project. Uh, you know, if you recall, the New Deal was um, an, a government effort to put unemployed people to work at various projects. Uh, this is where a lot of uh, national monuments were built. This is where uh, roads and, and, you know, through national parks were, were built. And you've got... Uh, attempts to uh, redesign uh, town squares and city blocks and you know and whatnot and and so one of them was to put writers to work uh, out of work academics uh, to to doing various projects and this was just one of them so uh, they uh, uh, had a trove of documents relating to the Salem witch trials that the students could go over. Uh, and come to conclusions about what happened in Salem and why. Um, and it is the results of this research by uh, an entire class full of freshmen, would-be history majors, that ultimately are brought together and that uh, Boyer and Nissenbaum um, published as Salem Possessed. And what they gathered and what they uh, determined was that the the Salem witch hunt the his, the the hysteria and the fear that that happened as a result of what happened in 1691 92 93 boils down to a number of things first of all it boils down to a competition with and tension between Salem town and Salem village I mentioned Salem Village was seeking to separate from Salem Town. And that uh, was something that Salem Town did not want because that means a loss of tax revenue. Uh, the people of the village uh, had successfully petitioned to have their own meeting house, and that's a step toward incorporation as an independent uh, municipality. Uh, but being out in the, in the country, as it were, Salem Town is for you know for what it was at the time a, a, an urban center. It also represents a a fundamental tension and divide between town and country, between the urban and the rural. Um, and within Salem Village itself, they found that there was enormous competition and division uh, amongst the you know these these families headed, you know, essentially by two very powerful families in Salem Village and Salem Town, and that would be the Porters and the Putnams. The Porters were the major players in, in town, and the Putnams were the major players in Salem Village. Uh, and as you will read in uh, your course texts about uh, the difficulties of the village uh, hiring and retaining a minister, uh, 
uh, culminating in Samuel Paris's controversial ministry starting in 1689, um, that the division over Samuel Paris plays into the Porter Putnam rivalry, uh, and that this was part of why the Salem Witch Trials boiled up as it did. And one of the things that they found, they went to back, they went and found Upham's book because they, they they were aware of it and they encouraged students to look at it. And of course, there's that fantastic map, which gave them the idea. Let's look at that map and let's figure out where are all these people living? Where are the um you know, people accusing others of witchcraft living? Where do the accused witches live? Where do other people who are giving testimony for, you know, for and against accused witches, where do they live? They looked at a 1695 petition to try to get Samuel Paris fired from his ministry and looked at that and said, okay, um, we can see patterns here with re, with relation to who is accusing people of witchcraft and who tend to get accused of witchcraft. Uh, and all of this was, was something that uh, at the time it came out, everybody said this was a fantastic kind of statement about socio-political conflict, economic uh, rivalry. Um, this, these are all harm, hallmarks of what was a rising tide at that time, what was called the New Left, uh, neo-progressive historiography. That is to say that um, history moves according to this neo-progressive uh, per, you know, perspective. History moves based on economic rivalry, economic conflict, um, and how these are expressed in varieties of social and political movements, and that's what tends to move uh, move history. So, here is some of the data that uh, Boyer and Nissenbaum's students um, compiled, and uh, what they found was, uh, you know, between the Porters and Putnams, and there are other people, obviously, who sit on the Salem town you know, Board of Selectmen, as well as the, the, the Committee of Salem Village. Um, but Porters and Putnams are the wealthiest families in, in this immediate sort of micro region. Uh, and so what Boyer and Nissenbaum found was, broadly speaking, what they see is that uh, initially, going back to 1680, what you see is that Porter Putnam power is fairly even uh, for the most part, okay, through the 1680s, except for 1685. 1685 is a significant point of departure. In Salem Town, Porters gain a distinct advantage. There are no Putnams on the board of selectmen, and there are two porters. Whereas in the Salem Village committee, there are no porters, but there are three Putnams sitting on the committee. Okay? And this pattern more or less bears out for the most part until you get to 1689. This is the point where Samuel Paris. Uh, assumes his ministry in Salem. And what you see in Salem town is that the Putnams uh, do a little better. They get a little bit of an advantage. They have two people sitting on Salem town board of selectmen, and there's only one porter. Um, while they maintain, they lose a little bit, but maintain for the most part, major influence in on the Salem village community. But starting in 1690 and then 1691, you see another flip. Two porters sit on the Salem Town Board of Selectmen, no Putnams. Two Putnams still sitting on the uh, Salem Village Committee, no porters. And then 1692, the year when the Salem Witch Trials really blew up, uh, there are three porters on the Board of Selectmen for Salem Town and to only one Putnam. And there are now two porters on the Salem Village Committee outnumbering 
just the lone Putnam. And Boyd and Nissenbaum said, aha. So, uh, you know, a lot of this seems to be boiled up in this sort of socio-political conflict, economic conflict between these two major families jockeying for power and influence in Salem Town and Salem Village. So, let's have a look at this map. Boyer and Nissenbaum and their students looked at this map and said, okay, we find all this Porter-Putnam rivalry. Where do all these Porters and Putnams live? Where do accused witches live? Where do their accusers live? And they came up with this map. Okay, they came up with this generalized map. So what you see here is they put an A down for the residence of everyone who accused someone else of being a witch, okay, who was not themselves accused of being a witch. So this would include, apparently this would include people who considered themselves afflicted or obviously someone who, who who believed an afflicted person's testimony against somebody and then added their own accusation. A D indicates somebody who gave testimony in defense of an accused witch. And then, of course, Ws indicate accused witches. And what they saw was that the preponderance of accused witches could be found uh, on the Salem town side of Salem Village. All of this is Salem Village, by the way. All of this is Salem Village. Salem Town is down here, okay, if you remember the map. See? Down here is Salem Town. So they were only focused on Salem Village. And what they noted was that based on tax records, and especially with regard to Porters and Putnams and all that, what they found was that the closer to the Ipswich Road that you lived, the, the closer you physically lived to Salem Town, by and large, the more likely it was that you were, at, you know, sort of aligned with the Porter faction, the more you were uh, tied economically and politically to Salem Town. The farther away from Salem Town you live, the more rural areas, the more you're tied in with the Putnam family, the more you are against the town in some way, shape, or form. And so what they saw was, wow, look at all the A's on the Putnam side of the, of the village, and look at all the W's and D's you find on the uh, on the eastern side of Salem Village that is more oriented to Salem Town. Aha! We know what's going on. So here's uh, the slightly cleaned up version. This is sort of the basic version that came that they, that they typed up. Here's the formal version that appears in uh, the book. It's basically the same, same map. And uh, this is definitely an extremely famous map. Okay? Uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, course, you're going to read a uh, an issue of the Wayne and Mary Quarterly that covers uh, discussions about the publication of Salem uh, Possessed, and a lot of them are going to talk about this map and say that this map is what made it famous. People looked at you know people would say sometimes if you don't have time to read all of Salem Possessed, just look at the map, uh, and you'll know everything you need to know. But there are other maps. There's other bits that they they analyzed. Okay, so land ownership in Salem Village in 1695. So um, I'm not sure you can see this key very well, but these areas that are shaded here are keyed to lands owned by people who were generally allied with the Porter family and were uh, opposed to Reverend Samuel Paris's ministry. And as you'll know from the reading of the books, Reverend Paris was a, a, a strong proponent of the witch trials. Um, and uh, the cross-hatched lands are lands generally owned by Putnam's or their, their allies who signed a petition uh, supporting 
Reverend Paris. Okay, uh, and so what they saw was okay. This looks pretty even. So I mean, the 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 the, lot, the dividing line here between the A's and the W's generally doesn't seem to hold up terribly well. But then they said, well, this is 1695, so maybe in the few years, in a couple of few years after all that turmoil, things may have begun to settle down a little bit. But so they said, okay, well, let's look at people specifically signing up the, the, you know, the petition for and against Samuel, the petitions for and against Samuel Paris in 1695. And what you find is that the closer to town you are, the more anti-Paris you are. The farther away from town you are, the more pro-Paris you are. And with a somewhat even mixture in the middle of the village. So again, we're looking at something that is uh, an anti-Paris faction that is dominated by the Porter family and a pro-Paris faction that is dominated by the Putnam family, okay? And again, looking at this factionalism and wealth, okay, we can look at uh, tax tables and see that the poorer you were, the more likely you were to be for Paris and uh, um, that, you know, rather than anti-Paris. Uh, if you're sort of of the middling sort, then it's pretty even. But when you get to the you know to greater wealth, uh, the wealthier you are, the more likely it is that you're going to be anti-Paris. So overall, um, what you have is a generally pro-Paris village. But that's not to be surprised. That's not surprising, right? Because where's most of the, the, the micro region's wealth concentrated? It's going to be in Salem Town. Salem Village itself, most of the people living in Salem Village are not going to be you know, very wealthy at all uh, unless they happen to be a Putnam or a Porter. And then finally, one of the things they that the that that, that Boyer and Nissenbaum and their students came up with was looking at uh, what they call a, an anti-Paris network as it developed in the you know since 1689, 1690, 1691, and 92, and noting that uh, a lot of people who, who uh, seem to be allied with the Porter clan and otherwise uh, signing uh, uh, the, the 1695 petition or, or otherwise exhibiting an anti-Paris orientation got accused of being a witch, right? Uh, whereas the pro-Paris network is dominated by accusers. So... This is, you know, an incredible, uh, uh, these are incredible findings. Uh, and when it came out in 1972, it was hugely popular. It was praised as a fantastic uh, analysis, one that finally gets to the bottom of what was going on. It had only a little to do with superstition and uh, the, you know, Puritan, Puritanism. It only has a little bit to do uh, with any kind of psycho, you know, analytical ideas or psychological ideas, uh, it's mostly just about competing over money. What? How, that's how could it have been otherwise, right? Uh, and it is a, a, is a landmark in what you know is now called micro history or you know uh, regional history, and um, definitely it eclipsed. Uh, the two major works preceding it, Upham and Starkey. Uh, Starkey is left entirely in the dust uh, by this. Uh, the only reason Upham maintains any, maintained any currency at that point was because Boyer and Nissebaum used his map uh, so well. And so it was extremely well-reviewed uh, and uh, was a winner of a major prize from the American Historical Association. Um, as soon, you know, uh, you know the the... You know, as, as soon as the uh, manuscript was accepted for publication and started getting all these great reviews, 
um, Boyer Nussbaum quickly uh, edited up a, a, a companion volume that they called Salem Village Witchcraft, uh, which contains um, uh, edited versions of the work, you know, the writer's project uh, documents uh, to go with it. Um, and so this becomes the word uh, on Salem Village Witchcraft uh, for the next. Uh, um, Geez, at least for the next uh, uh, fifteen years. So it's it, it's every bit as influential as Starkey's book was in forty nine, as Upham's was in, in eighteen sixty seven, and uh, a lot of people have focused again on this map. As I said, people who said if you don't have time to read the whole book, just turn to the page that shows you this, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about the Salem witch trials. It's brilliant, but it's also problematic, right? Because uh, this isn't all that's going on here. Um, you know, uh, you have to ask a lot of questions. Is this exactly where everybody was living? How careful were they in doing this? Well, I'm presuming they were reasonably careful. They admit to them. They admit we couldn't put letters down for every single person, especially every single person who was an accuser or a defender, because it would have resulted in a map that would be pretty much impossible to read. Um, okay, fair enough. They, th what they're doing is they're trying to take something that is ultimately very complex, and they're trying to boil it down to something that is comparatively simple. And they, you know, they never said, oh, this is all you need to know about what happened in, Sal in the Salem Wish Trials. Uh, but... Broadly speaking, what we have here is the Salem Wish Trials are the product of Puritan belief in the supernatural, fear of living in a, a, a wilderness uh, that beyond which the Indians live and beyond farther beyond to the north that you've got the Catholic, French, and Canada, and you've got the, 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 the recent political turmoil with the Glorious Revolution and the, 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 the hanging question about the charter and all of that, sure. But that's not enough to sort of, you know, cause something this strange uh, and, and terrible to happen in one, uh, you know, particular place, is it? No, it it's all of that, but then it ultimately boils down to this. Every town has its divisions. Every place has its economic tensions and political uh, wrangling and all of that, but it never results in towns and villages tearing themselves apart. Um, and, you know, so uh, uh, it is, again, it's an extremely valuable uh, resource to be sure. Is there truth to it? Absolutely. There, there definitely is credence to what Boyer and Nissenbaum found. But the problem with it, though, ultimately is one into, you know, it's a trap that historians are too apt to fall into from time to time, and that is trying to take something that is extremely complicated and try to apply a, a, a fairly simple uh, analysis on it so that you come away with a, a, a basically a two-dimensional uh, conclusion on something that is four-dimensional in nature. Uh, and uh, again, it was one of these things, most people, when they, when they study the Salem Wish Trials, this is the book that they read, or this book is on the list. Uh, and um, it, it, it absolutely is a good read. It, it is very interesting to watch the flow of the uh, analysis and the interpretation, um, and it's hard to argue with this. The pro that's the problem. That's what makes this such a, 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 an ingenious and pernicious uh, map because it's hard to deny what Boyer Nissenbaum uh, found in this. Um, and as I said, this is going to dominate the historiography for 15 years. There's going to be some more books coming out, and we're going to talk about those 
uh, in the next lecture. But the fact of the matter is, matter is this book is still uh, a, a staple of the historiography of the Salem Witch Trials. It is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. It keeps getting reprinted um, and uh, assigned in, in, in uh, uh, courses on the Salem Witch Trials in early New England history. Um, and so this is the this is the interpretation that most ordinary people, if they know anything about it, they'll either give you the Upham thesis or they will give you this one. And so with that, uh, I will uh, uh, end this video and we'll talk some more about later historiography later.